Well, good morning. It is good to be here. This was one of those days where I didn't feel like coming to work. Um, so I, I uh, my name is Vody Bachman. I, I, uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, spent most of my life in Houston, Texas, and um, have spent the last two years um, with my, my wife and our seven youngest children. We have, we have nine children. Our, well, my wife and I, and I and our seven youngest children for the last two years have lived in Lusaka, in Zambia, in South Central Africa, where I serve as Dean of Theological Education at the African Christian University there in Lusaka, and uh, had the privilege of working with the Reformed Baptists of Zambia, who are, who are starting uh, that university and, uh, and seminary there. Um, I spend six weeks a year uh, here in the U.S. Uh, doing uh, two-week tours, so I'll come three times a year for two weeks and cram as much as I can into those two weeks, and then I have one two-week tour somewhere else in the world. Um, and so this is how we, we've raised um, part of our support. We, we're, we're a unique um, missionary family in that we're, we weren't sent by an agency. We were sent by our church, by our local church, by our local Reformed Baptist Church. And so we raised part of our support through these types of events. Part of our support comes from my uh, publishing and writing uh, ministry, and then part of it comes from um, churches who have partnered, churches and individuals who have partnered with our church um, to support us. So this is my last tour here for the year, and um, I just drove in this morning, for those of you who saw me come in, um, I just drove in this morning from Jackson, Mississippi, so that's why I was getting out of the car, running to the bathroom, because I had to get here. Um, but I had to leave Jackson at the last minute because our first grandbaby is there in Jackson. And so I got to spend two days during this time um, with the daughter and son-in-law, whatever. <laughs> but the grandbaby, okay? <laughs> the grandbaby who just turned a year old last week. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's why. Five o'clock this morning, I was like, man, do I have to leave? But uh, no, it's, it's good. It, it, is, it is good to be here. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, open them to the book of Jude. Jude. If you ask what chapter, we'll make you leave now. <laughs> Jude. You know, I joke about things like that, but it's only jokes. I didn't, I didn't grow up in church, and I can, I can remember um, as a new believer having to use, you know, the, the index to find the books and, you know, feeling nervous about people looking at me because I didn't know where the books were and things of that nature. So, yeah, don't ever take anything like that seriously from me. Um, I, was, I was raised by a single teenage Buddhist mother and never heard the gospel until I got to university. So, you know, if you need to, if you need to use your index to find where the, where the book is, you go right ahead. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so, some of the rest of you will probably be there too at one time. And don't forget. Don't act like you've always been where you are. All right? All right. So in the book of Jude, we're going to talk about apologetics. And I, w I want to look at this passage, and I also want to look at the passage from which we get the very word apologetic, we'll do that later on, but I want to look at this passage because I want to examine some of the main reasons that we not only don't engage in apologetics, that, I mean, that's one thing, to not engage in apologetics, but it, it's, 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 it's not that, right? It's not like not engaging in evangelism, although I'm going to argue that apologetics is part of our evangelism strategy, but most people, when you talk about why they don't engage in evangelism, most people are afraid. Um, they don't feel like, you know, they don't, they don't do well with people. They don't do well with rejection. They, you know, don't want to sound like a freak or a weirdo or whatever, right? Um, so th there, there's the barrier for evangelism. With apologetics, there are some people, right, who feel like, yeah, I'm not going to engage in apologetics because I don't know everything. And, and, and we'll deal with that, too, mainly when we get to 
uh, the, 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 the Peter passage. But that's not why most people don't engage in apologetics today, especially younger people. For younger people, they don't engage in apologetics because it's, it's politically incorrect. It's not appropriate, right? Um, in, in the age of tolerance and inclusivism, um, you know, the only thing that, that, that we don't tolerate is intolerance. And apologetics seems intolerant. Um, so young people, yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't do that. Um, I'm not a social media fan. I have social media and I use social media, but I use social media as a petri dish. You'll never find me sitting around reading my feed. I don't think I've ever done that, right? That's not what I use it for. I use it for a couple of things. One of them is a, is a Petri dish. I just put stuff out there to see how people respond. And I go, yep, that's the deal. And one of the things that I've experienced, um, especially recently, especially in the last, you know, five, six years or so, is I'll put a lot of issues up, cultural issues, moral issues up there. Um, a lot of people get mad because they're like, you know, you have all these followers and you can be putting Bible verses and you can be like, yeah, there's pages for that, right? This is the page where you come if you want to know what's going on from a cultural apologetic perspective how we can be aware of it and how we can engage with it. And if you want to see some people engage with it here, that's why you're here. You want a page that's going to give you a Bible verse every day, I'll tell you 10 of them, right? But one of the things that I've noticed in the last five or six years, especially with young people, you address a moral issue, especially, you know, same-sex marriage, you know, transgender, homosexuality, and young people, the 18 to 35-year-old category, they pounce. They pounce because it's just so mean. And that's why they don't like us because we're so intolerant and we wouldn't have all these issues if we just weren't so intolerant and yada, 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 yada. And when, it, when this happens, not always, but oftentimes when this happens, I'll push back and I'll just say something like, you know, I, don't you find it interesting that I raised an issue that the Bible says offends God. And you're more offended by me raising the issue than you are by the sin that offends God. And usually there's radio silence, right? But, you know, sometimes they'll, I mean, they'll, 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 they'll try to push back at that for a while. But, I mean, they, they really, they are more offended. You, you, something that the Bible says is an abomination, right, before God. They are more offended that I have the audacity to call people out than they are with this thing that brought God's wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, right? As, as one... Uh, songwriter puts it today the only heresy is saying that there's heresy right today the only heresy is that Shailen and his song false teacher uh, I'm not even a rap fan but dude's calling people out in his song false teachers right and that line that phrase in the song today the only heresy is saying that there's heresy. The only thing that gets the 18 to 25 year old crowd ready to gird up their loins and go to war as Christians for the sake of righteousness is people who actually point out error. Because that's what's wrong. Because today, listen, there's an 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment is, thou shalt be nice. We don't believe the other 10. You press the other 10, you're a legalist, right? Especially if you press the other 10 in an authoritative manner. And by the way, the more I look at it, again, this is the Petri dish, right? This is not even part of my message. This is extra right here, okay? 
But as you, as you look out in the culture, in the Petri dish, it, and it's not even, and I'm not saying that I'm posting, you know, and I'm calling people names, and I'm, you know, I, no, that's not what's happening. But as I've examined over the last five or six years, what I've noticed is the thing that people find offensive is not being nice. That's what they say. But what they actually find offensive is being manly. You plant your feet, square your shoulders, lift your chin up, and say something without equivocation in a manly and forceful way, that in and of itself is not nice. By the way, that's preaching. That's preaching. Which is why today you've got these mealy mouth. Skinny jeans, mama's haircut, you know, that, 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 that's why today you've got entertainers instead of preachers, right? Today you've got guys who are doing pop psychology from the pulpit, okay? Guy preaches a sermon, imagine, if, you know, imagine, imagine, imagine this, especially on the hot button issues of the day where people are going to pounce on you for not being nice. Imagine this, imagine this, I'm starting a sermon and I'm like, listen. Today's sermon is on um, wife beating. And before I start the sermon, listen to me carefully. I love wife beaters. I have friends who beat their wives, okay? So don't hear me today bashing wife beaters just because I'm preaching from the tip. Now, you hear that and you go, huh? That's how every sermon on homosexuality, well, not everyone, because I got some on the internet too, but that's how a large percentage of sermons on homosexuality start. With a 15 minute apology and disclaimer for everything that's about to come after. And then you close by reiterating the disclaimer at the beginning. Why? Because the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice, which. When you exegete the culture means thou shalt not be manly. Now in walks apologetics. In this context. Right? In this context. And so you've got people out there who are like, yeah, that's no. Not, not cool, right? That in fact, it's not Christian. It's not Christian, okay? So let's look at this text. Jude, chapter 1, verse 1. In this little postcard. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James... To, and look at his audience. And this is going to be important. Because uh, one of the objections, the first objection we're going to deal with is this objection that apologetics is only for special forces, Green Beret, Marine Force Recon, Navy SEAL Christians. Right? Not for everybody. And notice I didn't say everybody, I said everybody. That's beyond everybody, right? <laughs> we in Arkansas, y'all know what everybody means, okay? We don't believe that. We believe that it is for the elite of the elite of the elite, right? So Jude's about to tell us to engage in apologetics. <laughs> but who's he about to tell? To those who are called. Anybody want to claim that one? Beloved in God the Father. You put like two hands up on that one, right? And kept for Jesus Christ. Now here's what's interesting. We have this, this really, this, this, this triune distinction, right? Or this triune identification, it's three different ways of identifying the same group of individuals, okay? But it's not only triune in that way, but it's triune because he's referencing the Trinity here. 
and the triune's God work in saving a people. You, you see the Father there, and you see the Son, Jesus Christ, but you, you don't see the Spirit. Oh, yes, you do. Yeah, who's the one who does the calling, right? Those who are called by the Spirit, beloved by the Father, and kept for the Son. Amen? Amen. This is for the people of the triune God. And I believe he has in mind here this picture of the covenant of redemption. This picture of God in eternity past. The triune God who has always existed. There was never a time when God did not exist. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Spirit is eternal. And they are eternally one God. And this eternal God exists in perfect unity and perfect harmony and perfect love within himself, within the Godhead. God has need of absolutely nothing because God is perfect. The persons of the Trinity are perfect and their unity is perfect. Their love is perfect. But this perfect God decided that he would spill over his perfection. In creation. But in eternity past, the Father, out of love for the Son, gave a love gift to the Son. He bequeathed to the Son a people. We find this in John 17 when, when Jesus talks about those whom you have given me. So the Father, in eternity past, gives a people to the Son as a love gift. The love of the Father toward the Son spilling over in these people whom the Father gives to the Son. And the Son, out of his love for the Father, wraps himself in flesh, experiences the humiliation of the incarnation in order to redeem the people that the Father has bequeathed to him. And the Spirit, who is the personification of the love between the Father and the Son, because of his love for the Father and the Son, actually applies that redemption in time to all of those whom the Father gave and the Son redeemed. And this is our salvation. This is a picture of what the triune God does. And so essentially one of the ways you can look at it is that the love of God, the love of the Godhead spills over in the form of creation and redemption. And our redemption is actually a participation in the expansion and declaration to all of the world of the love between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That's why we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that God can display his grace. Amen? That's why. He's displaying his grace. The Father's also displaying his love for the Son. Because that's what I gave him. The Son is displaying his love for the Father. That's who I redeemed. And the Spirit is displaying his love for the Father and the Son. It was applied. And they, and they are his. And mine. And his. This is important. It's important that he uses these terms. First of all, because he's identifying everybody. Amen? Amen. This is all of us. All of us. So, the first, the first reason that we don't engage in apologetics is because we believe the myth that it's only for the elite. It's only for select persons. And Jude, Jude obliterates that idea. Um, so does Peter, and we'll see that. But There's another issue, and this issue is that it's not loving. And that's what we talked about. Remember the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice, right? We don't believe the other Ten Commandments. Why? Because they're actually not very nice, right? He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So here we have this, this, this triune 
identification of the people of God, right? These people who are called by the Spirit, beloved by the Father, kept for the Son. And now we have, really, it's kind of a shorthand of what it is that we have in the Father, Son, the Spirit. We have mercy and peace and love. It's being multiplied to us. And, and the idea is that apologetics is not loving. Telling people that we're right and they're wrong is not loving. Okay? It's not, it's not loving. And there's really not a loving way that you can do it. Now, people will say that, you know, it's, it's, it's because of, you know, the manner in which you've done it. Right? But the manner in which you do it doesn't matter. If we believe that the very act itself of declaring a right and a wrong is unloving, okay? Now, here's the problem. What we're going to see here, we'll go to verse 3. We'll look at it more closely. But for now, again, we have to read this in order to understand the significance of what we find in verse 2. There's a juxtaposition that happens here. He says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. There's a word that he uses here. And I often said jokingly, you know, that it's like the closest thing to cussing in the Bible. Okay? It's, 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 it's ep- agonizomai. You, got, you almost got to like grit your teeth even just to say it. Okay? And what it means is to agonize greatly. The word is actually borrowed from wrestling. Okay, which with boxing is the oldest martial art. Okay, and so here's a picture. Jude is illustrating what it is that he's calling us to do spiritually, theologically, intellectually, and interpersonally. And he borrows from you know, the, this, the, uh, the Olympics, he, he borrows from sport and he doesn't borrow from racing. Hmm? He doesn't borrow from weightlifting. He'd have seen those things, right? No, no, no. He borrows from one man here, another man there. You beat him or he beats you. Go. That's his picture. It's manly and confrontational. Lord help you today. That's just not Christian. Neither one of those things is Christian, according to the modern day 11th commandment, right? That's just not appropriate. That you would be manly and confrontational and that you would actually struggle and agonize. Mm, No, that's not appropriate. But here's what's interesting. Right before, remember I talked about that juxtaposition? Okay, right before he says that we are to engage in this way, that we are to agonize greatly, that we are to agonize, I would argue also passionately. Right right before he says that this is what we're to engage in, he says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, how can love be multiplied to us if he's asking us to do something that's not loving? Riddle me that, Batman. Huh? If it is inherently unloving to engage with people like this, if it is inherently unloving to believe that I am right and you are wrong, If it is inherently unloving for me to be passionate about moving you off of that thing that you are holding to, then how can I have mercy and peace and love multiply to me while I'm engaging in that process? And the answer is, I can't. But here's the thing. And 
here's the problem. And it goes back to what we started with. And this is why that little theological excursion into, into um, the covenant of redemption was so important. You see, the problem with, with modern man, especially in our culture, um, and it's interesting because I live in a culture that just, that we're just, that's just not even a thing, right? Like, just being blunt. <laughs> that's, yeah, where I live. People will say stuff like that. And I, I at first, I was kind of taken aback, right? It's like, wow, you're all kind of harsh. I hadn't even been, you know, affected and infected myself, right? Um, but here's the problem. What those people are arguing is this. If the center of human interaction, if, the, if at the center of the interaction between one human being and another is this horizontal reality of love, where love is me doing everything in my power to not hurt you, disappoint you, or offend you in any way, then apologetics is unloving. Do you follow? I mean, if I view love, if I, I mean, if I, if I look at it horizontally like that, and, and, and I say, you know what, you just said something that hurt that person's feeling. That by definition, that wasn't unloving. I mean, that wasn't loving. You just said something that offended that person. By definition, that wasn't loving because love is a horizontal reality between you and the other person. And the highest good in this relationship is that horizontal reality. But if you understand that love doesn't even exist, apart from the triune God who is love. And if you understand that love then has to be defined, explained, and understood in the context of who God is, then you also understand two things. Number one, that love between you and me must not be defined horizontally until it is first defined vertically and the second thing that we know for certain is this is that if there is something in this horizontal relationship that is at odds with the truth that we know from the triune God then it cannot be loving so for example if you are an enemy of the triune God and I am so interested in our horizontal relationship that I deny that reality because it might be offensive to you, I am actually not loving you. That's like your neighbor who sees your house on fire at 2 a.m. but says, I'm not going to bang on your door because you're sleeping. That is not loving. That is not loving. I mean, you can just say, you know, if you see one person dragging another person down the street, that's just not loving. Mm. You were in a car accident, your car was on fire, and you can't get out. Drag me, if you can. <laughs> Two, three, four of y'all, right? <laughs> I mean, just come on. But again, if the only reality that you will allow to enter into your definition explanation and understanding of what love is is the horizontal reality then you end up doing dumb stuff like that you're in the weeds spiritually intellectually emotionally but I won't tell you because to offend you is the greater sin See, this is the problem. This is the problem. But when you see this in its context, and when you understand what he's done, when you understand that he starts with this picture of the triune God, and he talks about our redemption from the perspective of who the triune God is, 
And, and then when you look at this picture of mercy and peace and love being multiplied to us, right before he tells us to go to war, then you recognize that there is no contradiction. There is no contradiction. So no, the second objection doesn't stand. The third objection is that people who engage in apologetics, they major on minors. Okay? They major on minors. Part of this is deserved because of the way we think about apologetics. Right? We, we think about apologetics. So for, for a lot of people, you say apologetics, and they think about the teenage boy who is, you know, in speech and debate, who you just can't stand to see coming. Because everything is about not vindicating the righteousness of God, but proving that I cannot debate you. And even you, even Christian friends are like, oh, oh. If you got little kids, you might have seen that movie about O, oh, the little alien. He says his name's O oh, because all his friends, when he comes around, they go, oh. That's that's the sixteen year old kid who wants to be an apologist. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch, right? And we just kind of go, oh, oh, he's obnoxious, he's immature, right? Far less intelligent than he believes he is, right? Far less winsome than he believes he is. And he wants to be an apologist because in his mind, an apologist is someone who hammers on other people until they beat them into intellectual submission, right? So some of this is deserved. I remember, you know, as a new believer, I was, um, I was on, playing football at, at, uh, at Rice University. I was being discipled by some teammates of mine. And again, I'm a new believer, and this guy, you know, came to my door, and he was talking to me, and I didn't, again, I, I came to faith late in life, I knew who these people were, and so I, I go back to, you know, these, these guys on the team, these, these guys who were kind of mentors to me, I'm like, man, so this guy came to my door, and he was talking about the Bible, but I don't know, something just wasn't right. And they were like, do you have on a white shirt with a name tag that said Elder? I was like, no. They were like, oh, it's Jehovah's Witness. I'm like, how do you know? Well, because it wasn't the Mormons. It had to be the JWs. I'm like, wow, y'all, y'all are so smart. No, no, we're not. <laughs> so I went to the library and just looked up, you know, everything I could. I, I, coming in the library and people were like, you come in here? I'm like, I do, I do today. So I'm in the library, I'm just like going crazy, trying to find everything that I can find out. This guy comes back to my house, to my apartment, and I wore him out. I went back to practice the next day, and I was like, man, dude came back. He was like, really? What happened? And I said, man, he started talking about this, and I told him about that. And he started talking about this, and I told him about that. And he was like, you know, I'm going to have to call Brooklyn and see if I can get you an answer about that. And then I told him about this, I told him about that. I said, it was, it was ugly. And one of them, Brent Napton, one of the most gracious guys I've ever known. Brent was a senior. And Brent goes, you think he'll ever come back? And I said, no, no, he's not coming back. And he goes, isn't that a pity? And he walked away. And I'm just standing there going, I don't like him. Because <laughs> I understood exactly what he was saying. You were an obnoxious jerk who was more concerned about your victory than that man's soul. That's a problem. 
It is. It is. But that's not apologetics. It's not. That's, that's just, that's spiritual narcissism. It's not apologetics. What we're dealing with is not quibbling over secondary or tertiary issues. That, that's not what we're talking about here. This is important. A lot of people are like, no, we, we just got to be about the gospel, right? And here's what's interesting. Look at what he says. Verse 3, an apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write you about our common salvation. How many of you know that's a primary issue? It's the primary issue. Amen? So he says, I'm, under, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I was eager to write to you about our common salvation. I found it necessary to write. Wait a minute. I was going to write about this. I found it necessary to write about that. Whatever that is, is either part and parcel of our common salvation or it is equally as important. Either way, we're not talking about a secondary issue. Appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We are not talking about a secondary issue here. Apologetics is not about secondary issues. Okay? And part of that is the problem with our definition. And, and the definition that I'm operating off of is uh, apologetics is knowing what you believe, why you believe it, and being able to communicate that in an effective and winsome manner. Okay? Knowing what you believe, why you believe it, being able to communicate that in an effective and winsome manner. It's not knowing everything about everything that someone could possibly ask you. This is another thing that keeps us away from it, right? This is why we think it's the elite of the elite of the elite, okay? No. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that when we get to the Peter's passage. But for now, no, this is, this is not secondary. And why? Why is it not secondary? Verse 4. Here's where we're getting. 4. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people. And they do two things. Okay? Their ungodliness is manifested in two ways. Number one, they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. They, they turn grace into lawlessness. And number two, they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? They deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, it's interesting because what they are essentially doing in these, in these two things, they're attacking what we believe and how we behave. I would say in light of what we believe, right? That's, that's what they're attacking. What are these two people doing? They're attacking what we believe and they're attacking how we behave. In other words, they're attacking the gospel and its implications. That's why this is not a secondary issue. Because we engage in apologetics because people are attacking the gospel and its implications. If somebody is denying Jesus Christ, we don't just stand there and sort of nod our heads and go, well, we got to be nice. Right? I mean, if you leave here and, you know, you say, oh, yeah, you know, we were at this conference and there was this guy, you know, Vody Bauckham, and, you know, and they're like, wait, wait. Bodhi Bauckham was teaching you guys? Yeah, yeah, Bodhi Bauckham. Wait, hold on. The Bodhi Bauckham was... It could happen. <laughs> you laughing over there. And you were like, yeah. And they go, wow. It's, wow. I mean, like, this little short white guy from Mississippi. Two possible responses at this point. You could say, you know, tolerance of all viewpoints. I guess that's your interpretation. <laughs> or you could say, actually, we're talking about two different people. And spiritually, what we've decided to do is the former and not the latter. 
in the name of being nice. I mean, essentially, we've allowed people to pervert the gospel and its implications, condemning themselves to hell. But we would rather they think well of us than to press the issue so that they might think well of God. This is idolatry. Pure and simple. It's idolatry, man worship, and it's the fear of man. It's the fear of man and it's the worship of man. Which all come down to the same place. You are at the center, not God. You, the other person. I, I do not want to incur your wrath. And I do not want to disappoint you. And so I will do whatever I need to do to be in your good graces. I will watch you go to hell if necessary. This is the heart of the problem. This is the heart of the problem. And so there are a couple of things going on here. Number one, we misrepresent what apologetics is all about. So we set the bar so high that, you know, only the elite of the elite of the elite need apply, right? Um, and then not only that, in case that's not enough to keep you from engaging in apologetics, the enemy then gives us this false idea of love that sees the horizontal, not above the vertical, but instead of the vertical, okay, as the way that we define love. And as a result of that, people will deny the gospel and its implications, and we won't engage. Either because I just don't know enough to engage, because it's not that I just need to know the gospel and why I believe the gospel. Now I have to know every possible objection that this person could raise, every possible religion that this person could practice, every possible philosophy that this person could follow. Otherwise, I'm not qualified to get into this, right? So, and, and, if they can't, and, if, and if the devil can't keep you out on those grounds, then he keeps you out on the grounds of, wait a minute, you about to say something? Because that's not nice. And the world rearranges chairs on the deck of the Titanic, and we watch it. We watch it. The band plays on while the ship sinks, and, and we watch it. We watch it. We sit in our comfortable lifeboat with room to spare. And we just listen until the whistles stop blowing and the screams stop rising and their bodies stop moving so that when it's all said and done, we can say, at least we didn't offend anybody. You know this is not right. You know it's not. So if you've come to embrace or believe any of these objections, the first thing we need to deal with today is turning from them, rejecting them. This is not for the elite of the elite of the elite. This is for everybody. Amen? It's for all of us. It's for all of us. This is not 
unloving. It is the essence of being loving. Not, not only toward other people, but toward God. Amen? It is because we love God that we vindicate his name. We vindicate his righteousness because we love God. And we do this in the lives of people because we love people. I love you enough to offend you if necessary. Amen? It's not secondary. It's primary. And it's primary because what we're, what we're fighting against, what we're warring against, is people who are denying the gospel and its implications. The very root and core the very warp and woof of our existence as Christians. The very essence of who our God is and who we are in him. And when I believe when we understand these things rightly, we are provoked rightly. And the reason that we're provoked rightly is because we understand that we are not Arrogant people standing up in front of the world saying, I'm smarter than you are. Time, that, that is not apologetics. Apologetics is one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. And you remember when I said that this is part and parcel of our evangelism, right? Because what are we proclaiming in our evangelism? We're proclaiming the gospel. So if we're engaging in evangelism and we run up against people who are perverting the gospel and its implications, right? What do we do? Do we just, you know, keep going on with our presentation? They believe in the wrong Jesus. Okay, that's fine. You just keep holding on to that wrong Jesus and let me finish my Romans road. No. You believe in the wrong Jesus, I got to stop and back up. Amen? It's not, that's, no, that's not, uh-uh. I remember being on a plane, and often, you know, sometimes when I'm on the plane, I'm, you know, again, full confession time. Sometimes I'm on the plane, my eyes are open, my spiritual eyes are open, I'm looking for opportunities, I'm looking for, you know, I'm just, you know. Other times, I am worn out. And if I'm honest, I'm just, I'm sitting back in my chair and closing my eyes, just, Lord, please don't let anybody talk to me, just I don't want to talk to nobody. Just make everybody on this plane saved tonight. Just, you know. And if they're not saved, sit them by somebody who's not tired. Right? I mean, just, I'm just being honest. Some days, right? And it just seems like those days are the days when people just come sit next to me screaming. You know, we got to tell someone, this is one day in particular, I am, I am worn out. And I'm about to fly from the West Coast back to Houston just, you know, I'm sitting back in my chair, like, don't, just please don't. And this lady comes, and she's all bubbly, and, you know, and all this, you know, just stuff. And she's sitting down, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm, I'm, yeah, great. And, you know, but, but I'm speaking airplane language, okay? And if you've flown more than a few times, you understand that this right here, that means don't talk to me. Right? I'm not being rude. We're on an airplane. And there's certain, there's just rules, right? And if I'm doing this right here, the rule is, unless you got to go to the bathroom and I'm blocking your way, you know, just leave me alone. And if you got a condition and you're going to have to go multiple times, we just trade seats, right? Just, you just tell me and I'll give you this seat right here. So you don't have to make, I mean, that's just what, that's what, you know, no, this lady, she, apparently it was her first flight or something. She didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking and all this and, you know, and then finally there's a lull in the conversation and I'm like, great, now I can lay back down. She pulls out her book and it's a book about Jesus, but there's these pictures on it and, you know, the writing and the font and all this other stuff. I'm like, man, it's a new age book about Jesus. 
Well, it's not like I can lay back down now, right? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I was like, yeah, I see you reading a book about my Jesus. And she was like, what, your Jesus? I said, yeah, that's my Jesus. Yeah. Well, she was like, he's my Jesus too. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Depending on what you're reading in that book, right? It might be, it might be as my kids would say, another Jesus, right? <laughs> 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 And sure enough, it was. It was. It's this new age, just, you know, good man, good prophet, good teacher, you know, guru, da 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 da. I spent the next three hours engaging with this lady. You know, the whole, the whole rest of the flight, you know. And, and when we're finished, she's still just sitting there, like, writing notes down and talking about, you know. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. But, but why? Because she's sitting there reading about my Jesus, but it's this perversion of who he is. I, I, we ought to be rightly provoked by that not there's someone sitting by me who thinks they're smarter than I am I must prove them wrong and if you struggle with that just do this okay just do this I, I I'm a martial artist all right I um, train and compete in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you know Brazilian jiu-jitsu is is, is um, it's, 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 it's one of the grappling arts, and essentially, it's all about weaker, stronger people being able to defend themselves against bigger, stronger people. And, you know, one of my professors, and that's what we call him, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is professor. Anybody lower than that who's a teacher, you call him coach, right? We don't even use sensei and all that stuff, just professor. And he just, you know, always just would say, especially to us bigger guys, if, if you want to understand how this particular art works, you've got to stop thinking like you are always the biggest, strongest person on the mat. And I just looked at him one day and I was like, yeah, well, I am though, right? So, no, you got to stop thinking like that. First of all, because you won't always be, right? Found that out in the tournament. And he goes, secondly, you just won't even understand what we're trying to do here. You have to assume that Every time you have an opponent, whether you're here or in terms of it, you just, you got to walk on the mat assuming that this person is bigger and stronger than you are. That's the only way that you'll have the, even the proper mindset in this. In apologetics, guess what the wrong mindset is? I'm smarter than everybody. I don't approve I'm smarter than everybody. No. Just sit down going, this person, more than likely, smarter than I am. But that's okay, right? Because God uses the foolish things in this world to shame the wise. Amen? That's the proper perspective. And we'll see that when we get to, to Peter's passage. We, we don't do this because we think we're smarter than other people. Because that's not why we're Christian. We're not Christians because we're smarter than other people. We figured it out. We're Christians by the grace of God. And we're Christians because somebody was weak enough, made themselves weak enough to bring us the precious gospel. And we have to be willing to make ourselves weak enough, to make ourselves fools if necessary to bring the precious gospel to people. So no, this is not about arrogance. We're not provoked because we gotta be the smartest person in the room. We're provoked because Christ must have the fullness of the reward for which he died. He must, he must, he must. That's what provokes us. The glory of God provokes us. The glorious message of the gospel.
and the transcendent beauty of the miraculous salvation of sinners by his grace. That's what provokes us. And that's the attitude of the apologist. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness toward us. And we ask that your mercy and your kindness would render us humble, grateful, and passionate. Passionate for your glory. Passionate for souls. Passionate for preaching and clarifying the greatest news that the world has ever known or will ever know. Passionate to vindicate your righteousness and not our own. And we pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.